Hey there guys, it's Nick, the ASMR nerd, and welcome to another episode of Relaxing Reviews. Today I'm taking a look at another mechanical keyboard. This is a retro-styled mechanical keyboard. Now, I've looked at a handful of retro-styled keyboards here on the channel before, but they're pretty much all going for that 1980s kind of IBM Model M vibe. But people were typing on typewriters long before they were typing on Model M keyboards. And there are a number of mechanical keyboards these days that are aiming to merge modern convenience and features with that retro keyboard styling. And one of them is the low free dot. The dot is a compact mechanical keyboard with a 79 key layout. It features Gateron switches, a fixed white backlight, and Bluetooth functionality. So it works in wired or wireless mode. But its most striking feature is, of course, its retro styling. And based on the pictures of the board, I'd say it nails it. It has a really unique and interesting look to it. So uh, the folks at Banggood were kind enough to send over um, a low free dot for us to take a look at here today. As we're going through the review, if you're curious to check it out, look at some more details, maybe pick it up for yourself. There is, of course, a link down in the video description that you can check it out at. Uh, it costs $92 currently on Banggood. I've seen that price fluctuate a little bit with sales and such, so it's around the $90 price point. This is targeted, it seems, mostly at kind of creative types, typists, people who might be writing on their keyboard, but it's also somewhat targeted at gamers. It does say gaming keyboard in the title, at least on Banggood. So I'll be evaluating this in, in those various capacities, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's take a closer look with an unboxing of the low free dot. And here we have the low free dot in box. And it's a very interesting box, isn't it? You can tell that this keyboard is aimed at a somewhat different demographic than many of the keyboards that I review here. Primarily just based on the art. I get the feeling this is aimed at creatives, not at gamers. There's a lot less flashy kind of RGB stuff going on here. No sharp angles, no high contrast. It's actually quite nice. Here we've got a book with some reading glasses and a pine cone and maybe a couple of oranges, I'm not sure. And then over here we've got a cup of coffee or tea and some flowers. And up in the top corner, a pen, some more glasses. All very soft, all very, um, yeah, kind of creative things. Um, and that really does tie in with the, the aesthetic of this board. It has this modernized retro aesthetic that uh, I think is, is made to appeal to people that are looking for something a bit different than your typical gamery mechanical keyboard. It says here EH112S Bluetooth mechanical keyboard. I guess that's its uh, official designation, but the dot is what I know it as, and I guess that's sort of the branding. Uh, I guess this is the low free logo around this side. I should also point out that there's no glossy finish here. This is all very papery, very matte. OK, 
QR code, low free symbol, low free symbol again, another pen. And that's it. It does say something in Chinese up in this corner, but I do not know what it says. Maybe you do, if you can read Chinese. Here. Can't really get any closer. Hopefully that's readable for you. On the back, the theme continues. It's all very nicely tied together, very nicely presented. Uh, the same kind of graphics on the back here. And then a variety of uh, specs and things. I'll turn it around and give them a read in a moment. Another pine cone over here. And some stickers. This is maybe some kind of official low free seal of quality. I don't know, but it's a sticker anyway. I've never heard of low free before this review, I must say. I've never used one of their products, obviously. But, so far the presentation of this box feels very premium. This is just a, a sleeve, like a slip cover. This whole thing makes me think of books. It looks and feels like, almost like a dust cover on a book, you know? It says here model number EH112S, like we already saw. Housing material ABS, plastic, and PMMA. That's a type of plastic I'm less familiar with. I'll have to look it up. Input power, battery specifications. So it's got a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, which is pretty big. Uh, and certainly will help it last for a very long time in Bluetooth mode, especially if you don't have the lights on. Compatible with Mac, iOS, Windows, and Android. Some compliance information. In the box, we have a keyboard, a charge cable, a user manual, and a warranty card. Otherwise, we have some contact information down here, websites and such, some certifications. That's it. It does use the word Bluetooth on here. I've noticed that some um, inexpensive Bluetooth products don't actually say Bluetooth on them. <laughs> they say wireless. But I wonder if there's a licensing fee or some some kind of money that has to be paid to use the Bluetooth name or logo on your product packaging. Seems kind of crazy if that was the case, but... Alright. Well, I am suitably calmed by this pastel exterior. Very soft. Let's check out what's inside. This is what I meant when I said it's just a paper slip. And of course they call it the dot because it's got these unique round keycaps that we see here in stencil on this inner box. And then below the stencil and the low free branding we have something that says fun two meters squared. That's how I read that. 2m squared. I'm not sure what that means. But maybe it's their slogan. I don't know. More low free logos. And on the back, just some more 
of the same information that was on the back of the slip cover there. Okay. It feels pretty weighty. It feels like a very solid package. A solid keyboard inside. It looks like the top just lifts off. packaged. We have some packing foam. It's a fairly thin piece, but I suspect it gets the job done. And the keyboard in a matte plastic bag. Underneath makes a nice sound, doesn't it? The plastic, I mean. <laughs> and we have some accessories over on the side here. Let's check those out first. Accessories box. Says. And then it has a picture of a charging cable. Do you think this is USB Type C? I hope so. I really hope so. I'm getting pretty tired of seeing micro USB on modern keyboards. literally all there is in the accessories box. Just the cable. It occurs to me, I didn't actually know what color this keyboard was. Uh, it's available in several colors, I believe, including blue and white and red. I think we have the white one, judging by what I can see through this plastic bag here. But interestingly, a twist tie here. Interestingly, they have supplied us with a black USB cable. Now this is not necessarily a terrible thing, uh, given that the keycaps are in black, so it'll match the keycaps and will probably look fairly nice. It's PVC coated, so no braided cable here, unfortunately. USB Type A on one end, basic rectangular housing, no branding. On the other end, something interesting. Uh, bummer. So it is USB. A mini USB. It's not USB Type C. It's a little bit disappointing. Every time I see that, I just wonder why. Um, but we do have a right angle cable. It's fairly sharp looking. Quite smart looking. Um, and I reckon that's because, as shown on the diagram on the bag, the micro USB. Uh, jack is actually on the side of the keyboard, hence the right angle cable. Interesting design choice. This feels pretty long. I bet it's about six feet, give or take. Let's pull the keyboard out here. Mm, that's heavy. Yeah, that feels solid. We will, of course, find out for sure with the flex test. We have here a user manual. It looks 
very uh, minimal, minimalistic. It says here, designed by Sean at Lowfree. Sh Sean out there getting it done, designing keyboards. All right, Sean, well, let's test out your keyboard. Um, the interior is exclusively Chinese, which is kind of a bummer, actually. I was hoping we might get some English documentation in here, but nope, it's all Chinese. Pretty much all Chinese. Well, maybe not. There's some English on there. Weird. But it's mostly Chinese. We will be left to figure things out on our own. Or I will, anyway. And then a little, I guess, a warranty certificate. Also in Chinese. <laughs> I do not know how long the warranty is. Nor do I know... Uh, you know, if it's easily sent in for returns or not, or for repairs. I've come to the realization, I used to be pretty picky about the warranties on these keyboards, you know, when the information wasn't included, I'd get kind of upset. But these days, I'm more of the mind that even if there was a warranty included, the chances of actually getting warranty service finding someone to contact, sending it in and receiving another keyboard back, probably pretty slim for most of these China-based companies, at least if you're doing so from North America. So I've kind of given up that, that fight, I guess. But anyway, okay. that aside. Oh, okay. Interestingly, the English instructions seem to be on the bag for the keyboard. They couldn't be bothered to print them on paper. No, they're only on the bag. But it looks like this does tell us how to do uh, Bluetooth pairing and maybe backlighting control and stuff. That is funny. Okay. Strange choice, to be sure. All right. Oh. Okay. Very interesting looking. I'll read this later. And uh, we will do, um, you know, the traditional segment where we look at the backlighting and look at the Bluetooth functionality. Okay, so this thing looks pretty sharp, doesn't it? Uh, I like the matte keys a lot. Uh, they're all slightly scooped, just a very gentle divot on them. They've got a glossy white body with matte black keycaps. And of course, the shape of these keycaps is very unique. They're round or they're kind of two round things merged together. But what strikes me as most interesting, perhaps, is that they're, you can't read the legends with the backlight off, you see? They uh, are presumably double shot keycaps, um, or maybe they could be coated and laser etched. Let's find out, let's just pull one off here. You know, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. 
they look solidly black here i'll show you the cap is black uh, abs plastic but it is also coated but then the legends are shine through so i'm not quite sure how these are manufactured the stem or the socket i guess you call it is translucent so I bet you that's the color of all the plastic, and it's just been coated, UV coated. Which is a little less appealing to me. Um, these matte UV coated type caps tend to get very fingerprinty and mucky very quickly. I was kind of hoping that they would be uh, like a black PBT material uh, that would resist fingerprints, but it, it, don't appear to be and I don't think it mentioned anything about PBT on the box or the store page okay well um, let's well, we'll keep that key off for a moment I want to look at this switch in a second but first let's let's give it the old 360 here so the keys rest in this kind of scooped out space uh, it looks like it's almost cut out of the, pl the plastic. It's a very unique design. I've never quite seen anything like this before. You've got some low free branding pad printed on the side of the space bar. Uh, we also have a couple of pad printed legends up here for the Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, Bluetooth profile one, two, three, I presume. Other than that though, it's all just these laser etched and or double shot caps again hard to tell i think they're laser etched um, around the edges we've got these very smooth rounded sides and corners it gives it a very consistent looking design we've got a mold line that's visible along the back but the gap is very small um, and all this glossy plastic looks very nice right now. It feels like high quality plastic for what it's worth. It'll probably pick up fingerprints, probably pick up scratches and scuffs, but you're less likely to see those on a white plastic than a black plastic, I think. So that was probably a good choice on low freeze part there. Around the back, very little going on. We have rubber feet. One, two, three, four. Uh, it looks like you're kind of stuck with this board sitting at an angle. So if you like a flat keyboard, you're sort of out of luck. The case itself would sit flat, but unless there's a way to pull off. Oh, there is. Uh, but underneath, you can pull off the rubber, but underneath there's... Uh, hard plastic so built into the case so unfortunately there's a uh, no way to get this keyboard to sit flat um, and then we've got some you know more information certifications serial number nothing we haven't seen here already Now it gives you the Bluetooth name. Interesting, when you're trying to pair, you have to look for dot at low free. Assembled in China. Oh, it does have some instructions for Bluetooth pairing here as well. That's kind of nice that they put that on the keyboard itself. Okay, so nothing around this side, nothing around the front, nothing around the back. This side, the right-hand side of the board, where all the action happens. We have here two switches. We have a toggle to switch between uh, desktop, or no, I guess this is Mac and iOS, versus Windows and Android mode. It's a hardware toggle. It's kind of interesting. I don't think I've ever seen that before, but sure, why not? Here we have uh, 
another what looks like a three position switch. We have an off in the middle, Bluetooth mode over here. Oh, we have lights and on over here. And I'm not sure what the difference between Bluetooth and on is. But on does not appear to have any lights, whereas Bluetooth does. I assume that in the on position, when you have it plugged in um, via the USB connector here, um, then the lights will be on. Whereas if you have it in the off position and have it plugged in, the lights will be off. And then if you have it in Bluetooth mode, I guess the lights are always on. And then we've got that micro USB connector, somewhat regrettably. Okay. So, what you hear does sound a little bit hollow, but it doesn't feel like it. It feels pretty solid. There's, um, it doesn't feel like there's much empty space in there. I'll uh, flip the switch to Bluetooth here and show you again. Now you can see all those legends nicely illuminated. They are very sharp, and you know, I think they are actually double shot. Because if you look at the way they are done, for instance, look at the O there. It's got that stencil type look to it, which um, usually means that it's double shot. With a laser etching, uh, you don't need to leave that gap in round characters or closed characters, but you can see all the closed characters have that style, uh, which does suggest to me that this is, that these are double shot caps. That's very nice. The backlighting looks pretty even. Um, I suspect there's brightness adjustment, but we'll find out when we get to that point in the video. The layout is quite unique, isn't it? I haven't really had an opportunity to look at it very closely here, but we have a function key over here on the left-hand side of the board, which is atypical. Uh, we have a control and an alt, and then our OS keys are right next to our shortened space bar, also atypical, um, or the command key, I guess, on a, on a Mac. Uh, but it's a Windows key here. Um, what have we got here? We've got another Alt and a Control. We have dedicated arrow keys over here. Although the way they're offset is very interesting in that the, the up arrow does not sit directly above the down arrow. That's strange. We have a very small shift. We have a standard bottom row. Big shift over here. Big caps lock. Standard, enter. This all looks standard, but we've got a small tab. We've got a number row, ending in backspace, that's typical. We have a single delete key up here, and then we've got our F row and escape. Very interesting. And escape is actually, oh, we missed something here. Ah, uh, we've got a tilde key over here. We missed it because I pulled it off. I get this back on. You might notice too, well first of all, uh, these are pretty thick. There's really no flex to these caps, so they feel nice. Also, the stem or the socket is kind of atypical. I've never seen it quite like this before. Now let's see if we can get it back on easily. We can. It just pops back on. But of course, this is very much a, um, a carefully designed layout that will only really work with these keycaps. So keycap compatibility for this board, pretty much nil. I think you'd be hard pressed to find another set that would really work here, given this strange offset layout and, um, and just a typical layout in general. Uh, I was going to say, all the keys are gently scooped, 
except for the escape key, which is actually uh, convex rather than concave. And then all these F keys along the top are actually oval rather than round. It makes them a little bit shorter, which is interesting. They also have a variety of secondary functions, as you can see, uh, which illuminate more brightly than the actual F functions, don't they? They come out quite bright. Fascinating. It'll be an interesting layout to get used to. I'm not sure if it'll feel strange to type on or not. Uh, I do know that typing on round keys in general is a little bit trickier than square or rectangular keys because you just have somewhat less surface area. You're more liable to accidentally catch the edge or press in between the keys. But I suspect that these little, the little divots, the little concave centers of each key will help guide your fingers. We have the dots on the home row here. But basically, this is like a 75% keyboard. It's got many of the keys of a 75% board, minus a couple, I would say. I think it's actually got 71 or 72 keys in total. I also noticed we have a little LED over here. That's probably the caps lock indicator, I would guess. Okay. Let's, uh, let's pull this key off again. Take one more look at the switches here. I wasn't actually sure what kind of switches this board came with, but upon closer inspection, I see that we have a Gatoron blue there. I knew it would be a blue switch. I just wasn't sure what the make would be. Uh, let's just turn off that light for a moment so you can see the switch a little more easily. You can see it says Gator on there. Hopefully you can see that. It's got the typical blue stem. Gator on browns are, uh, again, very competent cherry clone-like switches. Although, generally speaking, I do prefer Gator on switches to genuine cherry. Honestly, I find them to be a bit smoother and a bit more stable. Um, and that does feel like the case here. It feels a bit smoother. Um, than a Cherry MX Blue. So, good choice on the Gatorons. I prefer a Gatoron Blue to an Otemu Blue, certainly. So, uh, that's nice. I believe this is only available with Blues. It may be available with Brown Switches as well. I can't remember off the top of my head. You can click through on the store page and take a look on Banggood there. But, um... I think blues are a good choice for this keyboard because this is very clearly intended to be a typist's keyboard. This is not made for gamers who want lightning fast response times. This is made for someone who enjoys the tactile experience of typing. And in that capacity, blues make perfect sense. Keys are a little bit rattly, but not too bad. Nothing out of the ordinary. Stabilizers feel and sound a little bit rattly. Let's take off one of these bigger keys just to see what they're doing for stabilizers here. Because this whole setup is a little atypical. But they just got standard cherry style clone stabilizers, no doubt. A nice touch is that the stabilizers are in white, which matches the top plate. Nice attention to detail from Low Free. All right, let's pop this back on. Also interesting to note, the keycaps are all the same profile as near as I can tell. They are all slightly actually angled uh, to improve the ergonomics of the board. They're slightly taller at the front than at the top or the back, um, but they don't increase in height up the board or anything. It 
just flat across the board. Very interesting. Interesting looking board. Interesting feeling board. Very different from anything I've reviewed here before. Last thing we're going to do before we get on with the uh, plugging it in and all that is the flex test. Let's see how it does. Good. It does well. <laughs> yeah, minimal flex. Just a little bit of deck flex, but very little. Um, a nice and rigid case, which is what I like to see. Um, okay, well, very positive impressions initially. Uh, largely based on the aesthetics of this thing. It looks really good. It's clear that this is designed aesthetics first, I would say. I don't want to yet say functionality second because I haven't tested it out, so that's hard to know for sure. Uh, but certainly aesthetics were um, an important design goal with this board, and I think they nailed it. I mean, it just has this wonderful, you know, typewritery, retro kind of aesthetic that also has this modern twist to it with this, you know, very rounded off plastic case. But overall, the design, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the old IBM Selectric typewriters. They actually had a case um, that was very similar to this, obviously much larger and bulkier. But if you look up the original IBM Selectric, uh, it definitely has this look about it. And I suspect that's what inspired this design. All right. Well, it's all well and good if it looks nice, but how does it operate? How does it feel to type on? How does it sound? How's the Bluetooth? We're going to check all that out next. And here we have the low free dot plugged in and switched to the USB wired mode. You remember there's those hardware switches on the side. Um, it's plugged in with its right angle connector. Hard for you to see, but it's over here. And actually, up until just a moment ago, it was flashing over here. There's an LED embedded right by the plug, and it flashes while the board is charging while the battery is charging, uh, but evidently it is now fully charged. Um, I did have it plugged in for quite a while before this, so I believe it says it takes about five hours to reach full charge from empty, I guess. Uh, as you can see, it is very bright. Um, the backlight is a fixed white backlight. There is no configurability except for brightness. So there are no animations, no reactive modes, nothing like that. It's just a fixed white backlight and of course no RGB. But uh, you can adjust the brightness and at its default brightness, which is uh, this one, it's maximum brightness. It's quite bright indeed. It's bright enough that it's actually casting light on the ceiling. Uh, which I've really not noticed uh, boards do before. Um, that could be in part due, of course, to the white chassis in this glossy plastic, and so it's very reflective. It does reflect a lot of light up. Uh, so to change the brightness levels, you just hold down the function key, which is weirdly placed in the bottom left, and F5 to decrease brightness, F6 to increase. So how many steps was that? Four? You start with off, one, two, three, four. Yeah, four brightness steps. And that's it when it comes to the backlighting on this board. Very bare bones. I will say the legends look pretty good when they're backlit. They are nice and sharp, although some of them, it's a little hard to tell actually what you're looking at um, just because of that kind of 
the stencil style of the double shot legends and because the legends are actually pretty small on this board um, they don't take up that much of the key but they do look pretty nice overall I will say uh, the other thing that we're going to look at here is um, Bluetooth functionality uh, so to use the Bluetooth you switch it to Bluetooth mode, which is done with the hardware switch over here. So this is off. This is Bluetooth mode. Um, the light over here flashed briefly. I'm not sure if it's paired right now or not. Let's see. I have paired it with my PC. I've not paired it with my phone. We'll do that in a second to test switching between. But let's go function one. So I think we are already paired automatically the PC. Yes, we are. Okay, so um, I have not noticed any noticeable input lag. Um, I'm just testing it out here, but yeah, it, it seems pretty immediate. I do not know what the polling rate of this keyboard is uh, when using the wired USB mode. That information doesn't seem to be available, um, but as I always say, there's always going to be a bit more latency in a Bluetooth mode. So if you were using this for competitive gaming, uh, I recommend wired over the Bluetooth mode. However, however, there is one fatal flaw when it comes to using this for something like competitive gaming. Um, and you know what? We'll talk about that in a second. First of all, let's just uh, do the Bluetooth thing here. Um, Let's pair it with my Android phone. So we hold down function and two for three seconds to activate the second slot. There are three uh, devices that it can remember. This is pretty typical. You can see that we are in pairing mode because the caps lock indicator is flashing over here. So let's bring out the phone. Let's turn on the Bluetooth. And let's look on the list of devices. Refresh. It should show up as dot at low free. Uh, and it is not showing up as that on my phone. It's just showing up as like a, looks like a Mac address or something. Or like a hex numbers. I'm not sure. But you know what? It shows up as a keyboard. So let's pair. There you go. And once it's paired, it shows up as dot at low free. I know you can't see this right now. Um, but it does appear to be paired, and let's just, I'll open a Google Drive uh, document here, just a fresh one, and we can type in it. So you can see, let's put this here. It looks a little weird on the camera, but hmm, there's a little bit of lag there. That seems to be a bit laggier than the PC connection. Um, but we should be able to switch back to the PC now going function one. We get a single flash over here and we are in fact paired to the PC. Very good. Caps lock, that lights up. Caps lock again. And that's basically it um, when it comes to the Bluetooth functionality. So it seems to be fine. It switches between devices happily. Um, it pairs quite happily. I haven't had any issues or glitches with pairing. This does use Bluetooth 3.0, which is a pretty old standard. Um, I guess it's cheap to implement. I prefer to see Bluetooth 4 for, you know, uh, better range and energy savings and things, but uh, the Bluetooth as implemented does seem to work fine. Uh, I'll test the range. I haven't done that yet. I'll test the range on it uh, just to make sure that it, it works from a decent distance. I'll let you know about that uh, when we reconvene for the, the pros and the cons and all that. Um, there are other secondary legends up here along the F row. You have your typical media keys over here. And then uh, brightness settings, which we looked at. Uh, F3 and F4 um, will 
bring up, well, on Windows, uh, that brings up your file explorer. And this switches to like the uh, task view, I guess they call it. I can't remember what they call it actually, but uh, it's that mode where, um, you know, you get, you see all kinds of recently used files and programs and things, as well as your various windows. I don't, I, it was something that was implemented somewhat recently in Windows 10, I think. Uh, and then these over here, are to adjust screen brightness, but that doesn't make a difference on my desktop. I guess it might on a laptop, uh, or if you're paired to a mobile device or something like that. And that is pretty much that. Now, I did allude to one fatal flaw <laughs> earlier, and I'll point this out here because it's, it's worth mentioning. Um, this is very much a case of uh, f design over function. Um, and that is the WASD keys. If you look at them here, ASD here, on a normal keyboard, the way the rows of keys are offset, your W is pretty much right above your S key. Uh, slightly offset, but pretty close to right above your S key. Uh, so when you're playing any game that requires WASD controls, which is most first-person or even third-person games, the W is right there. Here, it is very awkwardly offset. You see, it's set up sort of offset between the A and the S, and this is very uncomfortable for me to use because my middle finger is kind of like mushed up against my, my ring finger here. And uh, I have a really hard time, have had a really hard time getting used to this configuration. It's just not ergonomically sound, quite uncomfortable. So that almost ruins this board for gaming. Not exactly. I mean, you could presumably you could use the arrow keys if you really wanted, but they actually suffer from the same problem. It's what they've done to make this keyboard look nice, kind of wrecks it for gaming. Um, yeah, and you could do it, you know. I actually find it more comfortable to, you know, maybe rebind to E and go uh, E, A, S, D. But uh, it's a very strange situation, honestly. Um, and maybe you won't find it to be such an issue. You know, maybe different people have sort of different ergonomic requirements, but yeah, for me it just really doesn't doesn't work. And there's nowhere on the keyboard that it would work, because every row is exactly 50% offset from the row above and below. So anyway, that's an issue, and it definitely means that it's much more <laughs> of a typist keyboard than a gamer's keyboard. Um, but with that in mind, uh, let's test out the typing, shall we? It's time for the typing test. Let's give it a feel, give it a listen.
Alright, so now that we've had the opportunity to unbox the board, test out the lighting and the Bluetooth functionality, and take it for a typing test, it's time to run down the pros and the cons of the low free dot before I give you my final verdict. Let's start with the pros. The first thing that really stands out about the low free dot is that striking retro design. It looks really good and it harkens back to typewriters like the IBM Selectric without being kind of slavish to that design. It takes that idea, puts a modern spin on it, and I think it turns out really, really well. It is a very sharp looking keyboard. It's also a very well built keyboard. Despite being made almost entirely of plastic, it feels very solidly built. And that's important when you're paying for a product at this price point. It doesn't feel hollow. It's not a lot of flex to it. The plastics are all of fairly high quality. Also really pleased that this keyboard has both wired and wireless functionality. That's one of its big selling points. And it has a hardware switch on the side that lets you flip between um, the Bluetooth wireless mode and the hardware wired mode. Um, and it also has an off position, which is a kind of a weird thing for a keyboard in wired mode, but it makes sense for the Bluetooth mode aspect. And finally, I'm really happy to see that Low Free put a really big battery in this keyboard. I did not do a battery rundown test myself. My usage pattern tends to be I might use it wirelessly for part of the day, then plug it in later in the day or overnight or whatever. So I don't actually know how long the battery on this thing lasts, but I reckon it's a pretty long time. With a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, you're probably going to be able to use it for days on end, even with the backlight turned on before you have to recharge it. However, regrettably, the dot is not a slam dunk, and it does have a number of issues that are important to point out. The first, and this is a minor one, but is the micro USB connection. It's just not really something I like to see in this day and age. USB-C is the modern standard, should be adopted by all keyboards going forward. End of story. Also not thrilled to see that there's no English manual included. The only included paper manual is in Chinese. I was unable to find an English manual online, so there are perhaps some functions of this board that I am unaware of because I wasn't able to know that it could do those things. Uh, you know, you can look at the Chinese manual, you can use Google Translate app or whatever, get an idea for what it's saying, but like the secondary functions, for instance, along the top row, I just had to figure out by trial and error. It would be really nice if there were, uh, there was some English documentation and better English language localization in this package. Another somewhat disappointing aspect of this board is the fixed white backlight. Yes, it can get very bright, and it does have brightness adjustment in a few steps, but unfortunately that's where the configurability ends. There's no fun patterns or reactive modes or anything like that. No breathing mode even, which is a pretty basic kind of thing, um, and certainly no RGB here, so the backlighting is a bit disappointing. Also somewhat disappointing is the use of Bluetooth 3.0, which is a very dated Bluetooth standard at this point. Uh, I assume it's done to save a few dollars, but really, um, I can't imagine it costs that much more to put in a Bluetooth 4 module. Uh, the Bluetooth did work fine for the most part. It paired quickly. Um, it found its paired devices pretty quickly. Uh, but I did notice some perceptible lag when typing with this keyboard on my smartphone. And I don't know if that's the fault of the Bluetooth 3.0 or something else going on there. But regardless, a more modern Bluetooth standard would provide uh, better operating range, better battery efficiency, and would be a welcome addition to the dot. My last two cons here have to do with the layout of this keyboard. Now, it looks very nice. They've designed something that looks very uh, symmetrical, very nicely laid out, but they've had to make some compromises in doing so. 
The first problem is that it's missing some useful keys. For instance, no home, no end, no page up or page down, no print screen. These are all keys that I use quite regularly as a content creator when I'm editing videos and audio and this kind of thing. For that reason, the dot was pretty much unusable for me from a video editing perspective, which was disappointing. Uh, most compact keyboards get around this problem by putting those keys on a secondary function layer. Not so with the dot, despite the fact that it does have a function key and does have a secondary function layer. They just didn't see fit to map those keys onto the secondary layer. Now, yes, conceivably, you could map them yourself using software, but unfortunately, the dot does not come with any software of its own, so you're stuck using a third-party solution of some kind. And finally, what might be the biggest weakness of the dot is the awkward layout for gaming. Now, the issue here is that the rows of keys on the dot are offset differently than they are on conventional keyboard layout. They're offset by 50% on each row. So uh, it looks really, really nice, like I said. But what it means is that the WASD keys, which are used in like so many games um, for movement, are really awkward and uncomfortable to use. They kind of force you to crunch your fingers up together in an uncomfortable way. And unfortunately, that makes it really hard for me to recommend the dot for people who want to use it primarily for gaming. This is kind of a style over substance situation, and it's really somewhat disappointing to see. So what is my final verdict on Low Freeze dot mechanical keyboard? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It is a very stylish and sharp-looking retro-styled keyboard that successfully merges that look of yesteryear with modern sensibilities. And despite being made primarily of plastic, it is very solidly built and feels durable. The backlight is a fixed white backlight, and while it can get very bright, that's pretty much where the configurability ends. It's not going to be winning any awards in the configurability department. Uh, in terms of the wireless functionality, we have Bluetooth of the 3.0 variety, which is a pretty old standard. Nonetheless, it did function well for the most part. It paired fairly painlessly, and it operated fairly well, with the exception of when I paired it with my smartphone, and I saw some perceptible lag when typing. In terms of the, the layout and the usability, uh, it's got Gatoron Blue switches, which are a good choice for typists. They feel nice to type on, and they do emulate that clicky tactility of a keyboard, which is what this board is shooting for. Uh, but the round keycaps and the non-standard layout did take some getting used to. And as a matter of fact, I found that in general, I did make more mistakes than I usually do uh, typing on the dot, and I typed a bit slower. Now with time, you would get used to the layout and the shape of the keycaps, and I'm sure that would all smooth out. It, honestly, it reminds me a bit of learning to type on an ortholinear keyboard, which also, of course, has a non-standard key layout. Um, but this isn't the end of the layout woes on this board. There is another issue, which is that it lacks some important, in my mind, and commonly used keys, such as home and end uh, and print screen and these kinds of things. And most compact keyboards solve this problem by putting those keys on a secondary function layer. And the dot does have a secondary function layer, but they didn't bind those keys to it. Now, you could do that yourself using software, but as I mentioned, the dot does not come with any configuration software, so you're left having to use a third-party solution. 
but perhaps the greatest weakness of the dot is the awkward offset of the rows of keys which make it so that the WASD cluster of keys which are used in pretty much every PC game for movement or navigation those keys are very uncomfortable to use on the dot they force you to sort of contort your fingers in this awkward way that's very it's not ergonomic at all and it feels uncomfortable and for that reason I really cannot recommend the dot for people who are looking to use it primarily for gaming now for some people and some use cases this probably isn't such an issue and to be fair it's a nice looking board there are a lot of retro styled mechanical keyboards out there and none of them look quite like the dot and so if you are uh, in love with the aesthetics of the dot and I wouldn't blame you if you are it looks really sharp uh, then it is a recommendable keyboard it's not a bad keyboard by any stretch it is well made and it is recommendable for people who are using it for primarily typing on rather than gaming and that my friends brings us to the end of yet another relaxing review Special thanks, of course, to Banggood for sending over the review sample that we looked at here today. And if you are interested in checking out the Low Free Dot, maybe picking it up for yourself, there is a purchase link down in the video description where you can check it out. And uh, if you purchase through that link, a portion of your purchase does come back to support the channel, which, of course, I appreciate very, very much. And special thanks to each and every one of you for watching today. I really, really do appreciate it. I hope you found this video informative, and I hope you found it relaxing. And I look very forward to having you all back here next time for another episode of Relaxing Reviews. Bye for now, guys.